changing your life one story at a time. This is the Chicken Soup for the Soul podcast with Editor-in-Chief Amy Newmark. Hey, it's Amy Newmark with your daily dose of Chicken Soup for the Soul inspiration. It's Friend Friday, and since March is Brain Injury Awareness Month, we're going to talk to Dr. Carolyn Roy Bornstein today. She co-authored a book about recovering from traumatic brain injuries with me for Chicken Soup for the Soul a couple of years ago. It's a really important topic, and I'm grateful that Carolyn could take 15 minutes out of her busy day as a physician to join us. So welcome, Carolyn. Thank you for having me, Amy. Now, Carolyn is a practicing pediatrician. She's been treating children and their families because it's a package deal for 20 years. Prior to that, she was a registered nurse, and she's also a prolific writer. She's written books, blogs, articles, and she's a sought-after public speaker on the subject of concussions and traumatic brain injuries. Ten years ago, her son Neil was hit by a drunk driver in a crash that killed his girlfriend and left him with a serious traumatic brain injury. And so Carolyn has even more experience now with TBIs than she had before as a physician. And she has educated me quite a bit about TBIs and their prevalence in society. So Carolyn, I wanted to talk about your experience. And also, I want to talk about the fact that we're always surrounded by people who have TBIs And we need to be patient because you never know if you're dealing with somebody who has had a traumatic brain injury because it's it's a hidden injury. You can't tell from looking at somebody. That's true, Amy. There's in this country a traumatic brain injury happening every 18 and a half seconds. And there are 5 million people living with disabilities from traumatic brain injury. And as you point out, sometimes those um, disabilities are invisible. In fact, that's one of the big themes of the Chicken Soup for the Soul book that you and I wrote, Recovering from Traumatic Brain Injuries, 101 Stories of Hope, Healing, and Hard Work. The very first group of stories is titled, But You Look So Normal. And it's all written by people who have struggled, as you said, with with day-to-day activities of daily living, but look totally fine. So it can be really frustrating to you or I, like you said, in the grocery store. Um, My own son, Neil, is probably a good example of that. He is finishing up a PhD program in mathematics education, but he suffers from anxiety, depression. He sees a therapist. He's in a support group. He's on antidepressant medications. And you would never know any of that by looking at him. Yeah, I always tell myself that now. If I'm, say, at the grocery store and the person in front of me is only, you know, 40 years old and, you know, has, quote, no excuse for being slow, I realize, well, I could be behind somebody in line who has a traumatic brain injury and I'm not going to be sighing and rolling my eyes and doing all that stuff while he's like painfully counting out the money or trying to use coupons or whatever it is. I just assume that everybody has a traumatic brain injury and therefore everybody gets my indulgence and I will be patient with them. Yep, there's actually a story written in our book by a woman who describes that exact situation, being in CVS and trying to pay, trying to figure out, do I use a credit card? I have a coupon. Wait, what did I come here for? Now I have to put everything back in exactly the right order. So when I open my purse next time, I'll be able to find it. It's all these things that you and I may not need to deal with or may not realize other people need to deal with, but it's out there. Five million people, children and adults in this country. Yeah. And I think a lot of us think that, oh, Traumatic brain injuries are something that occurs to athletes and also to our service members. And they don't realize that you can get a traumatic brain injury if a door just closes against your head the wrong way. I remember we had a story in the book, a woman who was like an event planner and she was at a hotel and that big ballroom door like smashed into her head and she suffered a traumatic brain injury and is now changed for life. So it can happen. Another woman, didn't she hit heads against like her three-year-old? Like they were fooling around and they bopped their heads together? Yep, they were fooling around and bonked heads, yep. Yeah, and now she has a TBI. Exactly. So it's really, it's all over the place. And it means your life can change in a moment. You know, a bike accident, a car accident. A lot of these people too are in car accidents, suffer obvious injuries, um, you know, 
broken bones and bruises, and often the head injury can be overlooked, and then the patient is discharged and is at home and is wondering, why am I sleeping all the time? Why can I not remember what I went into the kitchen for? You know, how am I going to work? And it's not until later that the brain injury is even recognized. Didn't that happen when your son, Neil, was hit by that drunk driver? Didn't they first look at his obvious physical injuries and not realize initially that he also had a TBI? Yeah, they were just doing a CAT scan as a precaution is what they told me, that he was out for a few seconds at the scene. And so he said, just as a precaution, we're going to check his CAT scan of his head. And sure enough, he had a brain bleed and had to be rushed into the tertiary care center in Boston from our little seacoast town. And you wrote an amazing memoir about that, which if anybody's listening and really wants to understand TBIs and what it's like to be a family member and fascinating because it's from a physician's point of view, but your memoir is called Crash, A Mother a son, and the journey from grief to gratitude. And you got a fabulous review from Publishers Weekly. They said it was a remarkable testament exploring one family's journey through a medical nightmare and a new beginning. Now, he was injured, it was at least a decade ago, right? But what has changed? 12 years. 12 years. What has changed since then? I mean, is medicine better now at handling a TBI when it occurs? I think there's that. I think there's also, there used to be in that time, this sort of philosophy or belief that you were only going to regain whatever you were going to regain within two years. And I think I go to brain injury conferences frequently over the years. And that that view has really changed. I think the medical community is really recognizing that there are still leaps and bounds that TBI survivors can make, you know, not just days and months, but often years and years after their injury. That's one thing that's changed. Oh, that's very encouraging. So in your practice as a pediatrician, are you seeing a heightened awareness among the parents who bring in their children? I am, as well as teachers, school nurses, and athletic directors. They're all recognizing the importance of not just recognizing the possibility that an athlete has suffered a concussion, for example, but also getting them medically cleared after their period of physical rest and cognitive rest. Yeah. As a physician, what do you think of football, of soccer with the heading, of all of these different sports that involve possible head injuries? Right. And I think that's why it's becoming so clear and important that children be seen by physicians and medically cleared because it's those concussions one on top of the other that, at least in professional athletes, we're recognizing can lead to um, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And that's what we don't want to see in our young athletes. We don't know that that would it would happen, but the the research is still happening and the, the jury is still out, but we're erring on the side of caution with that. So if somebody thinks that they you know got bonked on the head and they're not sure what to look for and whether they should go to a doctor or not, whether it's a parent looking out for a child or whether it's an adult who somehow hit their head in some way, what are the tips you can give to somebody for what they should look for immediately after the injury and whether they when when they should decide to seek medical attention. Yes, well we're very um conservative in in diagnosing concussion. Um I once heard a neuro um surgeon define it as a bonk on the head and any symptom. So any symptom can be nausea, can be vomiting, can be dizziness, fatigue, foggy thinking. Almost anything can be attributed. And that's why it's kind of hard to know when children are ready to go back to school and back into the game because, you know, was some of this, you know, was there underlying depression or anxiety before this? And we just didn't recognize it. Um, There's a lot to go in it, but I would say a bonk on the head in any symptom, call your doctor. But then what does the doctor look for? Let's say you're an adult and you got hit in the head by the hotel ballroom door and you got dizzy. What is the doctor going to look for when you go? Well, we would look, we would do a thorough neurological physical examination. And if there were any abnormalities on that physical examination, consider imaging a person's brain. Okay. So you can see it. You'll be able to see something if there is a TBI. 
not necessarily if there's a concussion. If you have a concussion, you can have a perfectly normal um, CAT scan or MRI or imaging study. But if you're seeing an abnormality on the neurological exam, you're more likely to find an injury. There, there's also, um, I talk about and to therapists uh, very often because this the side effects of brain injury, anxiety, depression. Sometimes people in therapy will not even think to disclose that they had a traumatic brain injury. And I think it's important for therapists to ask that question in their histories. Wow. So how soon after TBI would something like depression or anxiety show up? Could it, is it days, months, or could it be as much as years? I would say all of the above, <laughs> um, not to be flip about it, but, you know, it it's also can be an undulating course. You know, people in our book will talk about good days and bad days. And, you know, you just can't plan. People with tra- traumatic brain injuries often just can't plan to show up at family events or things they're invited to because they just don't know if that is going to be a bad TBI day or a good TBI day. So I think it's a very variable course for a lot of people. Oh, okay. I see that. So one of the cool things about the book that you and I made is that it helps to support the Bob Woodruff Foundation. And we had a foreword from Lee Woodruff, which you went and got for us, which was great. So I'm very proud of our book in that regard also, because we not only gave people really valuable information about what to look for in terms of TBIs and themselves or their family members, we also told them how to deal with members of the public with TBIs. And then we alerted them to the fact that TBIs are prevalent in the military as well. And we are using the book to raise money for the Bob Woodruff Foundation, which helps returning wounded warriors, many of whom only are showing those, well, they're not showing them. They have those invisible wounds inside their heads. So I think what we did was pretty amazing. I'm very proud of the work that you and I did together. I'm proud of it too. And I'd like to just point out another positive in all this. And Lee Woodruff said it herself in her foreword for our book that stories are of paramount importance. And she talked about her husband's TBI and how it was talking to other families and hearing other family stories and reading other family stories that really helped them navigate their course. And I really found that when I was not so much writing my memoir, but Afterwards, after I would read stories at conferences of brain injury survivors, you know, people coming up to me, thanking me for sharing their stories. And I think there's actual scientific evidence that that sharing stories and writing actually does help people to heal. There's a a man named James Pennebacher who studies self-disclosure and looked at chronically ill patients who wrote about their illnesses versus patients who didn't. And the patients who wrote about their illnesses actually rated their quality of living higher. And you, it's sort of counterintuitive. Geez, if you're calling attention to your own illnesses, wouldn't that make you wallow in misery? But indeed, it did not. Telling your story, sharing your story is actually very, very therapeutic. And that's one of the other things that I'm incredibly proud of with this book, that the people who shared their stories and the people who read these stories can be healed and helped and given hope. You're right. We got a lot of thank you notes from people with TBIs who wrote for the book and did say what a great experience it was for them. So, Carolyn, thank you so much for being on the Chicken Soup for the Soul podcast today. I'm Amy Newmark. Come back for Motivational Monday, and we'll talk about one of my favorite topics, how to say no to the things that don't matter so you can say yes to the people and things that do. And if you want to learn more about Dr. Carolyn Roy Bornstein, please visit her website, which is drcarolynroybornstein.com. If you want to learn more about the book that we made together, Chicken Soup for the Soul, Recovering from Traumatic Brain Injuries, please go to chickensoup.com.